thank you all for coming. Um, for me, it's this evening. Um, for some of you, it's this afternoon. Uh, this is our first webinar in a four part, part series of creating your schoolyard outdoor classroom. Make sure, there we go. So just a little bit of um, uh, logistics here before we get started. This is our agenda for the webinar tonight. We're gonna do um, some welcome and introductions. We're also gonna do a short activity to uh, see where everybody is coming from, where you're zooming in from. We're gonna talk a little bit about NWF and our Schoolyard Habitat program. Um, and then we have a great group of educators with us tonight that are gonna share their stories, share their expertise, and really give you a, um, a story from each of them as to how they have developed a schoolyard habitat on their school grounds. We're gonna follow that up with a panel discussion with a couple of key questions that we're looking for them to answer. And then we want, um, we want to hear from you. So we want, to, um, we want you to put any questions that you would like um, answered by either the panelists or the presenters um, in the Q&A box. Um, and then we are gonna wrap up. That's where we're at and just a reminder, because we've set this up as a webinar, all the participants are uh, muted and we can't see each other. I'm sorry about that. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see where everybody is, is coming from. So again, welcome. Um, my name is Elizabeth Sofer. I am the Senior Director of K-12 Education for National Wildlife Federation. I'm the one at the top there um, with a, a beautiful lake behind me up at Glacier National Park, which I was lucky to visit this, this summer. Um, with me tonight is Maria Fowler. Um, she is a colleague and a director of regional education from the South Central Regional Office. So we will be your two main MWF presenters um, this evening. So I'm gonna stop sharing now so I can hand it over to Jillian Mitchell, who is also an NWF employee to see where you all are zooming in from. Perfect. I will start sharing my screen right now. And then I'll also put everything in the chat so y'all can access it. Um, so you and you might have to highlight that um, that link that I just sent, but if you could do that and then paste it into your browser so that you can participate in this little survey. If for some reason Jillian they can't figure this out, they can just put it in the chat too, right? Yes, they can definitely do that. Texas and Oregon. Wow, lots of Texas. Idaho, I saw in the chat. Mm -hmm. Virginia. Florida. Give it a couple more minutes here. Colorado. Being the one that saw the registration, I know that we do have educators from all over the country that are joining us tonight. So that, that's pretty impressive and um, very exciting on our end. Mm -hmm. So Jillian, will this stay up if people want to continue to put it in or? Yes, I can have it running for as long as uh, this webinar is. Okay. Okay, perfect. 
So I can stop sharing my screen and I will hand it back over. Thank you. I am going to share my screen again. Okay, so let's dive right in. So I just want to um, talk a little bit about NWF. Um, we are the organization that's hosting this webinar tonight and our Schoolyard Habitats program um, has been with NWF for quite a while. NWF actually has a very long history of conservation and education. We've been around since 1936, so quite a while. Um, as you can see on the slide, our mission is to ensure that wildlife thrive, thrive in a rapidly changing world. But we also know uh, that in order to save wildlife, we need to address the needs of people. So making sure that all of us have access to clean air and water, so communities, um, easy and equitable access to nature and protection from the severe impacts of climate change. And as an organization, we have affiliates across the country. So with our affiliates, we do this through policy, conservation, and of course, education. So our school yard habitat program is part of a larger garden for wildlife program, which has been in existence since 1973. Um, it's the nation's largest running and largest movement dedicated, I am sorry about the dog, dedicated to helping wildlife locally and reconnecting wild spaces. One person, one yard, one school, and one community at a time. So National Wildlife Federation Schoolyard Habitat Program grew out of our Garden for Wildlife Program. Individuals who are creating habitat in their communities wanted to engage their schools and their students and the teachers. So we created the Schoolyard Habitat Program in 1996. The program has really evolved over the years to incorporate not only creating habitat for wildlife, but providing a wide range of benefits to the school community. Our Schoolyard Habitat Program is a standalone program but it's also part of our eco schools program. So it's a pathway, one of our pathways of sustainability. So schools can come to the program either way, earn awards and as well certify their schoolyard habitat for free. So as you can see here, we're almost up to 10,000 schoolyards, which is, is really exciting. And we hope all of you are already a certified habitat or will become one. So what are the benefits of a schoolyard habitat? Why, why create a schoolyard habitat? Equitable access to green space is really a key component of developing a schoolyard habitat. Everyone should have access to open space, clean air, water, and healthy soil, but this isn't always the case, especially in communities most impacted by racism and wealth inequality. When you create a schoolyard habitat, you give every student in your school and their families a chance to connect to nature. As well, spending time in natural spaces contributes to improve mental and physical well being, safety, and neighborhood health. Planting native gardens can provide opportunities to connect and enjoy the natural world. Kids and adults reap many benefits from natural settings, from reduced stress to enhanced social interactions. A schoolyard habitat isn't just for creating vital habitat for wildlife and people. They grow vital learning environments for students and teachers. And research has shown, shown that students are more motivated to learn and do better in school when they feel their learning is connected to a larger purpose. The environment can be a compelling context for teaching, especially STEAM, um, science, technology, engineering, and the arts. And NWF calls this green STEM, the marriage between traditional STEAM and environment-based education. When you build a schoolyard habitat, you can help your community build climate resilience. The ability for communities to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to the impacts of climate change. Native habitats create shade, reducing temperature, they store carbon, they improve air quality and reduce stormwater runoff. Schools can serve as hubs for community re climate resiliency. As many of us have re realized over the last well, almost two years now, during the COVID pandemic, outdoor environments such as schoolyard habit habitats can also offer safe sites 
for student learning and school activities. Expanding classrooms into outdoor class outdoor spaces on and off school grounds decreases the density of indoor space. It reduces the risk of the virus transmission and offers a range of health promoting practices and social emotional benefits for students and staff. Increased diversity. Uh, we all know we're in a biodiversity crisis. Um, over the past century, human actions have caused an extinction crisis. A 2019 UN report found that about 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction many within the decades and more than ever before in our history. By creating a schoolyard habitat, you can help to restore local native biodiversity, which is the variety of living organisms in a given area, humans to invertebrates to fungi to microbes. And lastly, creating community. Creating and sustaining a schoolyard habitat takes a community, but it also creates a community. Your schoolyard habitat has the potential to grow and strengthen relationships within your school and throughout your community. If you reach out to the broader community from the beginning, you build connections that can bridge cultural differences, transcend language barriers, and cultivate local support for the schoolyard habitat. When communities are healthy, wildlife flourishes. So, one last thing that I want to um, touch base on here before we move to our presenters is our brand new schoolyard habitat planning guide. We recently released this planning guide um, and this webinar series, as I said earlier, is based on that planning guide. This guide has been developed to help you plan, build, and maintain your National Wildlife Federation schoolyard habitat, leading you through a clear step-by-step -step process. And you also will find green STEM learning opportunities for students and many environment-based teaching tools. It is focused on a seven-step process of engaging the community, creating the habitat team, assessing the site, designing the habitat, building the habitat, maintaining the habitat, um, and of course, celebrating your success. So our next presenters will dive into these seven steps and explain how they accomplished creating a schoolyard habitat on their school ground. So Mary, I'm gonna hand over to you. Great, thanks Liz. Thanks so much for that introduction and that overview. And uh, welcome everybody. It's so great to see you this evening and thanks for uh, taking the time. I know you all are super busy, but we're really delighted to have you here this evening and to um, share what we hope will um, set you on the path forward to creating some wonderful outdoor learning spaces for your students or improving on ones that you may already have on your campuses. In selecting today's presenters, um, we identified teachers, who can, uh, teachers whose campuses offer a variety of different settings in which to create a schoolyard habitat and also to teach in the outdoors. So we have um, kind of a, 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 an urban sort of mid-sized habitat. We have a large suburban, sorry, no, we have a, uh, we have a, um, a mid-sized urban, ha suburban habitat, a small urban habitat, and also a um, habitat in a rural community to share with you today. We also tried to select teachers from different parts of the country and with different levels of experience. So we have a teacher from Florida, we have a teacher from Oregon, and we also have a teacher from Texas this evening. And uh, I get the good fortune of presenting these fabulous educators. And we're gonna start first with Marcia Cordona from Royal Palm Elementary School in Miami, Florida. Her schoolyard habitat is on a suburban campus and is quite large in scale. Marcia will highlight the importance of creating and connecting to the community and creating a team. So Marcia, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share with you this evening. And yes, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about the, how important building a community is for success, it's really crucial for success to have the right people on board on your team, your community. Our community consists of our students, parents, 
definitely administration is the first ones that we need to get on board. And we have also tapped into local businesses. Um, and in my opinion, and as you can see in the pictures, we have parents out there working. We have um, volunteers that have come out to maintain our, our school grounds, our different gardens and habitats. And um, we've learned throughout the years, I've been at this, I've been building, creating and establishing different types of gardens in our school since 2007. And one of the things that I've learned throughout the years is that my most valuable member in my community and in my team is definitely my students. Because, and if we can go on to our next slide. Once we recruit those students and they take ownership and they become part of that program. And in my personal experience, what I have been doing is that every year I come up with a different project and I go ahead and involve my fifth grade class, which is that class that's leaving the school. Now our students begin with us in pre-K, many of them or kindergarten, and they, they start a project and they work through it throughout their fifth grade year and they feel that they're leaving a legacy. And I tell them, you're leaving a part of you. This is a legacy. This is something that you're leaving. You're leaving an outdoor classroom. You're leaving a garden. You're leaving an area where other children will come in to learn and you will be remembered. And by doing so, I've also built a connection with them and a lasting support. As the years go by, students go into middle school, high schools, and even into college, and they're required community hours. My students come back because they wanna take care of that project that they worked on. So they come back to do their community hours in their elementary school. And they come back to take care of what they had gone ahead and built. So it gives them a sense of ownership. The other thing that we've learned is that if the students are involved, the parents are involved. Once the students are excited and hyped up about a project, you're going to get, definitely those parents will come on board. Unfortunately, under the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we're not allowed to let our parents back into the building. But throughout the years, like I said, since 2007, every garden, every area, every project that we have worked on, the parents have been our number one supporters and have been present both physically as well as economically and have pretty much has shown support in all manners and ways. The other thing that we've done is that we reach out to our local businesses uh, through letters. We go ahead and we, we, uh, include, we uh, write grants, anything that we can find that will help us build, the, to work on these projects and go ahead and, and like I said, continue building that connection and um, that community and that Habitat team. And as you can see in the pictures, we have a local business that came out. We created an outdoor classroom under our, our tree. And we also created, which you saw in the presentation, an outdoor classroom within the two buildings with sales. We were trying to find way and definitely we are blessed. We're in Florida. So it's either very hot, somewhat hot and maybe cool for a week. And then, you know, the weather is always perfect for us to be outside. And we've taken advantage of that and we've spread ourselves throughout the building. And even our existing gardens are being turned into outdoor classrooms now so that we can get our children out there excited about learning, hands-on experience. These are things that you don't pick up in a book. And now, how do we build our teams, or the members of our teams? Like I said, the first person you need to get on board is definitely your administrators. Once they're on board, then you have, tap into your students. They are so creative. They have so many abilities. There are so many things that given the opportunity children can do, they will surprise you, especially with technology nowadays. And what we've done is that we've seen their strengths, we've tapped into their strength and given each one of them those responsibilities. We have leaders within our team. Our Habitat team is a team that consists of many uh, various fourth and fifth grade members. And within that team, we have different areas. We have children that are in charge of butterfly gardens, children who are in charge of the food forest, 
children that are in charge of the recycling of our Pine Rockland Gardens. And then we have children that are very creative and they, want to, they, they don't want to be outside all the time. They don't want to get involved, but they do want to participate. So they're creating a newsletter and they're getting that information out to our community through our website. They're the ones creating that and we've created a green corner and the children are working on that also. And we've tapped into, as I mentioned earlier, our local business, our Home Depot. Um, any organization we have locally, the education fund, and we write grants, we write letters. I have the children write the letters. I mean, who can say no to a letter from a child, right? Asking for support. We've gotten support from our local Winn-Dixie. You know, you have them out there, you want to give them snacks, you want to give them drinks. So wherever we see that it's possible to find support and to find sponsors, we tap into it, we send letters. Once that's completed, then the children will send out thank you letters. We've created gifts. We've gone out to the, our gardens, created bottles of herbal vinegar, and sent them to these donors with thank you letters and pictures from the children so that they can see where their money has been invested and the difference that they're making. Truly, once you build this community and you have these teams in place, you see that everything else starts flowing it is a lot of work and definitely I can tell you, like, as I mentioned, I started doing this in 2007. It's baby steps, you, take, you start building up and developing, but we have, especially under these conditions with the COVID-19, uh, we have found that the outdoor classrooms have been the best thing that we could have done in the year 2020, 2021 for our students. And we are continuing to develop that and expand on that because the children need to be outside. And my experience throughout the years has been that the things that these children learn outside, they're never gonna learn from a book. The experience- yeah, Thank you so much. We okay. really, really appreciate your time. And when we do, Quine and the panel, we look forward to hearing um, more of your stories because they're wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. So our next panelist is uh, Jason Siptak. He is from Bonham Academy in San Antonio, Texas. His habitat is on a smaller urban campus, and Jason will focus on assessment and design in his presentation. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm Jason Sipak. Uh, as she said, I, I teach at Bonham Academy. Um, we're located in an urban setting of San Antonio, just south of downtown in a high traffic area known as Southtown. Uh, I teach eighth grade science, algebra, environmental science elective, and I am the committee head for uh, the environmental science pillar of our school charter. Um, one thing that makes our location unique is uh, that we lie within one of the major monarch uh, migratory routes. Um, our initial site assessment, um, you need to consider, you know, a lot of questions you need to ask yourself. So things we needed to ask ourselves, uh, what will the gardens be used for? Or what will this particular project be used for? Who's gonna be using, uh, who will be using it? Um, what amenities uh, will be needed for those who will be using and man uh, maintaining it, such as access to running water, tools? Um, will there be enough shade for students and teachers to feel comfortable, uh, but also enough uh, sun for monarch, butterfly, and pollinator habitat? and the sun loving plants that it requires. Um, it also needed to be conveniently located for teachers and students and the public and ultimately for things like art projects and community implementation. Uh, next slide, please. The next, yeah. Uh, oh, purpose of involving students, okay. Um, so one of the things that we, uh, so involving students is it's important to involve the students in the community uh, in whatever way you can. Uh, be creative and do what works best for you and your community. One way that I was able to involve our students uh, was through a site inventory and a biodiversity audit of our campus. Uh, students conducted a schoolyard uh, site inventory to determine the potential areas uh, for this project or for pollinator gardens. Um, they helped in the design by assessing the biodiversity needs of the campus. Uh, we created one large campus base map using Google Maps on a projector on a large sheet uh, of paper on the whiteboard. And then we traced the outline of the campus, the buildings and other structures uh, with pencil and figured out our scale for uh, our mapping purposes. 
Um, the Schoolyard Habitats Planning Guide, as far as I know, uh, or has an excellent lesson on how to do this with your students. I actually learned it in a professional development with National Wildlife uh, Federation with Ms. Fowler and Ms. Uh, Ms. Bishop a couple years ago. Um, but, and, and then I took that original map, had it duplicated on a large Xerox machine, and then we took that map, divided it into sections uh, for each group of students. Groups were responsible for site inventory and biodiversity audits of their own section or areas of campus. And then we used those uh, audits. Um, we used that data to help us to decide the best area on campus for this project. Involving the community, um, we were able to uh, bring in some community to help with the design of, the, of our project. Uh, we had some knowledgeable parents and professional firms uh, to help us, the the uh, our project was a um, or is a uh, it's a rain harvesting uh, wild uh, uh, monarch butterfly and pollinator habitat, and so um, we were able to do a uh, we conducted a design and visioning uh, charrette with these professionals for both the site plan and our plant selection. Uh, we also had San Antonio River Authority uh, Authority uh, help us with our location uh, selection. And, uh, and helped our students and has helped us, our students with watershed demonstrations and field trips over the years to help build uh, student awareness of our place in the San Antonio watershed. Um, our campus administration also played a part in selecting the site. Um, and then also campus administrative support, uh, like Ms. Cardona said, is uh, a very essential for district support. Without the campus administrative support, um, the district won't support it. Too. Um, and, then, and it also uh, provides the basis for a larger program for us, which is that uh, environmental science pillar of our charter. Um, helpful lessons for uh, me that I would like to share uh, is just start small. Um, you know, what's an appropriate size for you and your school? Um, start within your means. It's going, the garden's gonna need regular maintenance and, and unexpected challenges do arise. Uh, if you start small, you can focus on the quality of your garden and you'll avoid overwhelming yourself. Uh, some of our first projects were in these concrete cylinders that we all on our campus refer to as the culverts. Uh, they've been great in that they offer excellent weed control because there's really no way for weeds to get in there other than seeds being blown in, but then they're easy to pull. But at the same time, um, they're more challenging to keep uh, watered. And then I had another helpful lesson too. I will get there. Is there another slide? Yes, okay. And then another one is um, another one of uh, my helpful lessons uh, that I really learned from doing this over the years is, is be flexible, be creative. Um, for previous gardens, we would ordinarily organize huge Saturday work days to bring in our community for planting projects. But this particular project, uh, the planting of our rain harvesting butterfly habitat coincided with the pandemic. Uh, we had to develop a creative way to get our plants in the ground so they, they wouldn't be in pots all summer long because they wouldn't have survived that way. Uh, we were able to recruit families who were quarantining together to come in and plant. My wife and I would place the plants and leave the tools and families would kind of swoop in and do the planting and then we would come back and pick up the plants and the tools and, and put them all away for everybody. We were able to do this about a half a dozen times and we were able to plant the entire garden this way. Um, summer watering schedules is also uh, very helpful. Um, you know, make sure that you've got a plan in place for summer watering, especially if you're in an arid climate like ours. Um, you know, we need to, you know, we've, we've got to visit and water the, the garden, you know, in our summers at least twice a week. And so we were able to use, or we use Google Documents or the, like the Google, the, the Google Docs to, um, to, to uh, get that uh, all put together for everything. And, uh, Gardens are like uh, living organisms, right? They're gonna respond to stimuli, but they also need constant attention. Thank you. Jason, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate um, your presentation. And I love in both of these presentations, on the community, um, making sure that the community is a big part of your effort and also the really creative things that were done, done during COVID. Um, you know, the, the, the parents coming by and picking up the tools and planting and then in um, Marcia Cardona's presentation, um, I love seeing those sales up between the building. What a great way to provide you know, shade, but that you don't necessarily have. 
So our next presenter is um, Car Cara Contreras from Brixner Junior High School. Her habitat is um, kind of average size and it is in the rural community of Klamath Falls, Oregon. Kara is new to working with schoolyard habitats, um, not brand new, but newer than some of the other folks. So we're really looking forward to hearing your perspective, Kara, on implementation and maintenance. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, my, again, my name is Kara Contreras. I teach seventh and eighth grade science at Brixner Junior High. I'm part of the Klamath County School District. And I'm currently in my physical classroom. We've just ended classes just in time for this presentation. <laughs> We're in um, South Central Oregon, very rural area. Um, and this is my sixth year teaching overall, but only my third year with the National Wildlife Federation School Yard Habitat programs. Um, so I personally began learning more about monarch butterfly population concerns and habitat loss. And from there, I knew it was a topic my students would also quickly become invested in. Um, and sure enough, just after the first week of discussing and researching the monarch butterflies conservation issues, um, I had challenged my class to flood our school with posters explaining why our garden was so important to the monarchs. And during my pep talk for the poster assignment, one mm -hmm. student shouted out, like a revolution, a monarch revolution. And our Brixner slogan was born at that point. Uh, next slide, please. So a big uh, lesson I've learned and uh, re-echoing from the other two presenters is building connections and relationships really is key. Um, initially, it was the relationship with my principal that was uh, instrumental in the approval of converting this random patch of weeds at the side of the building to um, you know, a working classroom space. Once my principal was on board with the vision, she began helping me ask for donations. Um, and we received many donations from the com community, including a generous amount of native plants and milkweed from a local nursery. And those particular plants just hadn't been sold prior to the winter season. So they donated those to us and we planted in the fall that first year. Um, and I tried to make every garden decision and improvement student driven. Uh, for example, mapping out the pathways, measuring borders for materials, leveling, plant labeling, anything. Um, and students even made one of my favorite projects was stepping stones for the pathways through the garden instead of purchasing, purchasing them. Um, and we ended up needing even more. So we invited our Bridges Special Education Program students to join us for another round of stepping stone crafting, which was really fun. Um, each project in the garden often would have gone much faster with adult hands and looked much more professional, but I knew if the students had put in the work, they would take more ownership and pride in the space. And I tell each graduating eighth grade class that they need to come back and take their high school senior pictures in their garden. We're still too young of a school. We'll see if they, they take me up on the offer. <laughs> At open house and other school events, I made sure to have students show off their work in the garden to their families. And then I ended up having parents offering help for field trips and guest speakers. As the garden grew, so did student and staff interest. Um, and so we ended up starting a uh, before school program that we called Eco School Club that met before school hours uh, to include anyone that just couldn't be a part of the ecology science elective course during our class day. Um, and now other teachers are starting to use the outdoor space now that we have outdoor seating and um, especially the art class and the English class, they go out and write poems and sketch quite often. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some of the most challenging things about implementing the garden was um, creating a layout for the garden that would help with the future maintenance. And in retrospect, we really didn't do a great job of that. Um, if we had spent more time drafting and mapping out the drip line system, and laying down the weed barrier to mitigate uh, invasives, um, before we planted a single starter, <laughs> things would have gone smoother. So I highly encourage a thorough drafting process with dimension, spacing, um, and consideration for future growth, especially with the watering and invasive weeds. Um, so we almost lost, we almost lost the garden during the initial COVID quarantine period. I, as a teacher, wasn't even allowed to be on campus for uh, like a month and a half. So, and at that point, we had not 
put the drip line system in place yet. We had just bought the materials, but we hadn't put it in place. So I was just praying they would survive. And for the most part, they did because we used native plants that were meant to be here. And um, we did have to transplant some of the plants to salvage the better half of the garden and then kind of restart the back portion to improve uh, the weed barrier in that location. But at that point, I started asking for a lot more help from community, um, our local nursery, gardeners, retired teachers. I really started reaching out for help um, at that point. So in an attempt to, uh, another pitfall was uh, starting with a donated uh, load of soil that came from a construction site just down the road. And because at the at the beginning, we just had gravel and pigweed and it wasn't anything uh, great. So we needed soil on top and it was just donated. Um, and I was really excited because that meant free. Um, but by the following spring, I was really not enthused because the we had been diligently watering a lot of invasive seeds. Um, so I do encourage if you have the money to buy to, uh, you know, really good topsoil to start with if possible. Otherwise, weed barrier will be your friend and, um, and the drip line for us has also been key for summer maintenance. Thank you. Um, so over the summer, my, or sorry, during the school year, my ecology elective students maintain the garden throughout um, our school calendar year and they go out to the garden at least every other day. They wanna go out every day, but sometimes we just can't make it out there. Um, and then over the summer, um, I only had to go out once a month because now everything's on the timed drip line system and the weed barrier we put in place last year really, really helped with the invasives. So I, it was a huge improvement um, and decreased the maintenance time a lot. Occasionally our custodians will check on the garden if not, I'm not around or if it's especially hot and I'm a little worried and I'm not in town. Um, and then next summer, uh, there's already plans for our summer school students to be checking in on that garden so that um, hopefully it's really on students' shoulders, not adults at that point. And then lastly, uh, I'll reiterate, start small. Even if it's just a couple milkweed plants on the back side of a building, it could turn into something much bigger, um, but start small. <laughs> the shade created by just a couple milkweed plants or flowering plants can attract much more wildlife than you think. Um, and in our case, we actually attracted a family of barn owls and they spent over a week um, as fledglings hiding in the shade of our milkweed because everywhere else on campus is pretty exposed. So that was really exciting last year for, for myself and all, all our students. Um, so don't get discouraged. Building momentum for a project can take time, but it's very much worth the investment. Thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks so much. That was that was awesome. And I'm loving the advice that everybody is giving to start small, you know, take it take it one step at a time. And I'm also loving the acknowledgement of some mistakes along the way, because believe me, if you're if you garden, it's, it's all trial and error, right? You know, you, you set out with some great intentions, but it's organic. It's an organic process. It's a matter of trial and error and you learn as you go. So um, the, the, the worst combination is trying to be like control things too much. If you're a control freak, you will find gardening really difficult. <laughs> and if you're not, um, you'll have a lot of fun with it. So um, the next thing we're going to move into is a panel discussion. And uh, while we are getting the panel discussion, if you have any questions for the panelists, if you could go ahead and uh, type those into the Q&A box, uh, we would appreciate it because that's where we will be uh, uh, joint, we will be opening the discussion up to the audiences through the Q&A box. But I did want to start this panel discussion by um, asking a question of each of the panelists. And uh, Marcia, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you. Um, what has motivated you to take the leap to teaching outdoors? At what point in your career did you say to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm, I need to be outdoors more. I need to get these kids outdoors. I'm, I'm done with the, the classroom or, you know, 100% classroom, whatever it may have been. You want to hear your story. Actually, um, as I said, I started building gardens in the school in 2007, but in 2008, 2009, 
I probably got one of the toughest assignments ever. I got a fifth grade ESC class where really it wasn't supposed to be three fourth ESC, but it ended up being three fourth ESC. And in the state of Florida, you have to pass that FCAT science test and you have to pass that math test. And um, I wasn't getting through to them with books, but when I took them outside and we started uh, learning outside, hands-on, the measurement, the different faces of the moons, there were so many concepts, both from the math and science that came to life outdoors. At that point, when our scores came back, to be honest with you, I had someone from the district visit our school because they wanted to know why my scores were so high considering the group of students I had. And when I explained to them, they had some doubts, but uh, how do you teach the, the, psych, you know, the, cycles, of the moon, cycles of the moon? I said, well, how did gardeners before, how did farmers plant? How did they choose when to plant? And I started going through all the different lessons and explaining to them, this does work. And it really does work when they're ESE students. They, they need to see things, they need to touch things. They are all different learners. It doesn't, a book is not enough for them. So the science book and, and a lot of the math concepts became a reality. Once I had that experience, I continued, even though it seemed like, I, and I, I really was told, uh, are you sure you're teaching or you're outside playing? But when our scores came back, they realized I was teaching. And it was validated that this was probably the best way to teach that group of students. That's awesome. What a great story, Marcia. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. And are you saying ESC or ESC? ESE. These are children with learning disabilities. Thank you. Thanks very ESC, much. Children with learning disabilities. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Jason, I want to uh, ask the same question of you. What is it that inspired you to start taking your classes outdoors and to start teaching in the outdoors? Um, I've always, I just, I've always felt like it was, you know, in growing up and, and kind of seeing our environment change. I mean, I guess I'm old enough now to, to remember the days when there wasn't litter all over the place and um, I don't know. I just want students to be better stewards of their environment. And I feel like getting them outside uh, helps them to do that. I mean, it, it, I think we all really understand is, it, it, that, you know, once they're out there, they, and they see the insects and they see the plants and they see the birds and they see, you know, how cool it all is. And they, they just have a much better appreciation for it. And, um, Really, it's just that I, I want them to have a better appreciation for nature and 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 for and 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 I like a lot of the things that uh, Elizabeth was saying too. You know, just like you know, there's so much that we can do uh, just ourselves, even if it's just a little bit. You know, like the the carbon sequestration and you know, creating habitat and improving groundwater and all of it. So, I just I figured I'm in a great position as a teacher to um, you know get these kids to understand nature and, and kind of brainwash them in a good way, I guess you could say. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I find that create that connection to, to nature so that they hopefully will, will turn into stewards one day. That's awesome. Thank you, Jason. Um, Kara, how about you? What is your story? How did you, how did you become enamored with teaching the, or the idea of teaching outdoors? It's hard to follow these two. Um, Jason, you stole my uh, answer a little bit, but as a millennial, um, it's been a lot of guilt uh, as a millennial feeling like uh, our uh, climate change and other conservation issues are so big and uh, ever changing and not always in the direction we want them. And I see my students feel overwhelmed when we talk about these uh, concepts about climate change or just ecosystems in general and how they've uh, evolved or, or the way they should be at this point. And I knew uh, personally, I wanted to make a difference. And it's really hard to see these big challenges in our life around us and know where to start. So for me, I, I knew kids were spending too much time in front of the screen um, even myself, <laughs> and I wanted to get back to nature like I was as a kid. And um, so that was, it was just fun to start with, 
Um, and then with the Monarch Mission curriculum that National Wildlife Federation has, I've noticed and I'm so thankful that the Monarch Butterflies provide this platform that you can launch from to talk about bigger conservation issues. And it's such an innocent, small insect that is undeniably beautiful. No one, no one can deny it. And they, and you automatically feel committed. All students, I've never had a student not feel the need to run and plant a milkweed after we talk about how, you know, their, their caterpillars can only eat milkweed. And um, so from there, we've, we're just able to talk about so many more conservation issues in a productive way um, about species that we might not find as beautiful or quote useful to humans. So it's really expanded my students um, depth in our conversations. And so I'm thankful for the Monarch Mission curriculum that way and the programs you guys provide. It's awesome and inspiring for adults, not just the kids that we teach. That's great, Kara. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really, it's really cool to hear about the, you know, the species sort of focus and the, the monarch butterfly being something that can kind of launch you into these other conservation issues and discussions. So thank you for that. Um, I want to ask one more question of the panelists, and then we're going to address the Q and A. Um, we're curious uh, when you move from being an indoor classroom teacher to an outdoor classroom teacher. Um, what does that take? What is that transition like? Um, do you consciously do things differently? Um, can you uh, 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 speak to that? And uh, this time we'll start with Jason. Uh, one thing that I did differently, I don't, I don't take all of my classes outside. What I, I primarily work with my environmental science elective course outdoors. Um, one of the things that I did, and this is certainly not a freedom that everybody has or, or a, a flexibility that it would, everybody would have, is I actually asked for that class to be uh, held in the morning. Um, San Antonio can get quite hot. And, uh, and so, you know, if we can work in the mornings, it's better uh, for us. Um, but, and I guess just doing it, like it's, you know, I, I, I also have, you know, we've, we've got other gardens here that are available to other uh, teachers on, on campus and it's, it can be tough. Like you don't necessarily want to be outside, but it, because it can be dirty there, it's buggy, it's humid, it's hot. Um, you know, you go inside you're sweating and, and uh, I think just, just diving in and just doing it and, and, you know, taking the, taking the leap, I suppose. Great. Thanks, Jason. Um, how about you, Kara? Um, logistically, I, I also don't go out every day. Um, and it's, again, usually my elective students as well with the ecology elective. Um, but I do take my other classes out um, occasionally. Um, I logistically take clipboards. So you don't have to convert your whole curriculum uh, just to go outside. I mean, if you have a paper assignment, put it on a clipboard. So I bought a classroom set of clipboards that we go out with. Um, and then I, with the switch to a lot of things having to be digital, um, we, I did have the district buy a hotspot for us because <laughs> the garden's far enough away from the building that uh, we needed a hotspot out there for the Chromebooks to work. So I do recommend that if you want to do things digitally. Um, also, we bought these really neat benches that have a back to them that will rotate. So they turn into a half bench. So kids can be sitting at them with their backs like a bench or they rotate it and they can be sitting forward on it and have a little desk in front of them. So that was a big improvement this last year that it actually the school decided to buy that because they really wanted a formal outdoor classroom space that I had been previously asking for, but COVID was the nice push for that. <laughs> and, um, and then lastly, oh, a shady place. Uh, right now, we don't have any formal shade uh, structure. That would be a dream in the few coming years. But for now, I just find the shady side of the building um, and that works out really well. So taking a break from the garden, oftentimes, it, it doesn't have to be just for a garden project. It can be any assignment, take them out, find some shade <laughs> and, and get them on the clipboards or Chromebooks. And having discussions outside is, 
it's just so much more fun than in the classroom. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. And you actually did get a, um, a, a question. Um, would you be able to put a link in the chat box or follow up with Morgan regarding um, where you got those benches? <laughs> and then uh, if you can't yeah. put in the chat box right now, we will we'll send that out to the participants later. Excellent. Yeah, I, I might have to find it later, but I will. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Um, Marcia, how about you? What what is uh, what does it take for you when you're moving from an indoor teacher to an outdoor teacher, an outdoor educator? Um, actually, I, I'm a reading teacher, which is okay. what all the garden, it just doesn't seem to go with the curriculum that I teach. But I've learned to adapt the reading. The books go outside. We also have um, a hot spot so when we need to take those computers outside. We have purchased different types of seatings. We have the clipboards and we have created, as you saw, an area under a tree with the benches. Mm -hmm. And we also have that area with the sails, but we had existing gardens that with these portable seats or um, we have some for the smaller children that are like rockers. Uh, we have cushions. So we've provided even we, we have even purchased uh, whiteboards that we take outside. Mm. So we have gotten as much throughout, throughout the last, I would say, since we were for, for last year for, with the pandemic, we've just focused into buying all of these materials where it would be easier to create that outdoor classroom. And again, our greatest benefit is the weather is usually pretty perfect in Miami, Florida. We do have those days that it rains a little too much and we have those days that the sun is a little too much to bear, but we do have shaded areas. And of course, we, we, the children would love for me to take them out every day, but we usually do this once a week and we do go out and um, read. And we'll read our novel outside and have our discussion or we'll, we'll do, I always try to tie in some of that steam within my reading so that we can incorporate those outdoor classrooms. Fantastic. Thank you, Marcia. Thanks very much. Thank you. I turn to the, um, the Q&A box right now. There are a couple of questions uh, for you panelists. One is, do any of you participate in the IB program? Do you guys have a resource that you like to use or incorporate content knowledge and skills in your outdoor classroom? So first of all, do any of you participate in the IB program? No. Okay. Then let's go to the second part of that, because that's also another question here is, you know, what are some of your, your tried and true, um, let's say fall garden activities since we're, we're in the fall that you do with elementary students? I guess since I'm the elementary teacher, I should be the <laughs> one answering that one. Um, we, one of the things that I started this year in our reading series uh, we study about Teddy Roosevelt and national parks. So one of the things that I do is I take the children out there so that they can use their senses. They take their journal and they're using their senses and they're picking up leaves and they're identifying plants. They're writing in their journals, they're drawing, uh, they're finding the similarities and differences, comparing the different leaves. They categorize them. So I'm somehow, we measure. So all together, we're doing a little science, a little math. We're always sticking to that reading curriculum and we're doing some art also. Uh, the other thing is that, yes, definitely here, fall is the time to start our gardening, to start planting. So we have all those seeds that we've started to purchase. I start assigning different beds and areas. We have what we call a food forest where everything that's grown there is edible, but it's also because of our portable chairs and so on, we have been able to create it into a classroom. And now we start assigning beds to different um, grade levels, giving them seeds and they each plant what they would like to grow for the year. And with their journals, again, they are measuring, they're monitoring, observing, taking care of their plant, they're weeding, and at the end, they're harvesting and taking home whatever they grew. Very nice, thanks, thanks Marcia, that's helpful. Um, I'm going to go to the chat box because I see one here that, that might apply to, to several people. Um, how do the students handle bugs? I know some kids are highly afraid or reactive. So what do you do about that? 
Kara, let's go. Let's yeah, go. Um, I have had a serious, uh, <laughs> not what you want to deal with, but I have had a, a serious allergic reaction happen. Just one, just knock on wood, um, in my classroom. And we had the EpiPen uh, near our garden. So I, I carry out, there's an emergency kit that we take out. And now I, I have a place to store closer to the garden than my classroom. And um, usually by middle school, those students who are really allergic already know that. But I, I have had a couple students who found out they were allergic to certain plants, like the pollen or such, and they would get a little bit of a rash. So at that point, they turn into, they have other jobs like a reporter or photographer, um, and they're less in the garden and more the garden. outside of the garden. Great, thank you. Anybody have anything to add to that, either Jason or Marcia? Definitely that I've handled it the same way. And actually the one that has had allergic reactions have not been the student, but has actually been me to certain things. <laughs> Thank God it hasn't been the students, but they are children that for some reason, they don't real, they don't want to sweat. They mm -hmm. don't want to get their hands dirty. They don't, and, and that's okay. I respect that. I, if we don't force anyone, we give them other jobs. We always need a photographer. We're using our iNaturalist app to identify plants, mm -hmm. to identify different animals that we find, anything that we find out in the garden. So we give them different jobs. And eventually you notice they do start getting their hands dirty. Great, thank you. Uh, Jason, do you have anything to add or is that? Is that yeah, very, very similar. I mean, I'll find them other things to do, iNaturalist um, and those sorts of things. There is always other things to, to take care of, watering. Um, there's mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of ways to, to have them, um, but I have had a few uh, plant rashes from plants and things. No major stings or anything. A couple stings, but not, not uh, anybody who was uh, alerted to it. Okay, great. Well, um, we are uh, just about at time now at 629, and we do want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I'm going to turn it back over to Liz Soper to kind of wrap up and uh, close us out. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, and I just want to echo that. Thank you so much to our presenters. I, I just love these stories. I could listen to it all night for sure. And I'm, I'm hoping that these stories were inspiring and will engage you further in checking out um, our new planning guide. Um, we will send out this information to you. Um, those of you that have um, registered, we've got the information. So, but this is the link to our new planning guide. It's up on our EcoSchools website. Um, it's fully downloadable and free to you. So please do um, check that out. Um, we also ask most of you to do a short survey as part of um, us better getting to know um, what you all are looking for so we can we can adjust our webinar series. We have some ideas, but we also wanted to hear from you. So if you didn't do that earlier when you um, received an email from me, if you can actually um, go to that survey and do that now, that would be great, but we'll also send the link out later. And the last thing that I just want to mention is that we are, um, this is a series, right? And we have the next webinar um, all set. It will be November 10th, which is a Wednesday. And the link below that is the link to register. So um, we certainly hope we get to see all of you again. And again, thank you so much for spending the time with us. And um, we hope we'll see you again in November. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.